So welcome everyone to this week's uh, e-lecture series talk. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, as you know, this webinar uh, and all the videos on the webinars are for educational purposes only, not for medical decisions. Um, if uh, you have any questions, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So um, for now, all the interactive features for attendees have been disabled to ensure optimal quality for everyone participating. Uh, if you have questions, um, you know, you won't be able to use a chat. And if you raise your hand, we won't be able to do anything about that. But if you email this email address, emorymskradiology at gmail.com, um, at the end, we will um, go through your questions with the speaker. Um, this video will be recorded uh, and uploaded to the YouTube channel. A reminder, attendees have not been given permission to screen record any of these talks, which may contain uh, material under copyright unauthorized recording, use, distribution, and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. <coughs> All right, so with that, I'm going to introduce today's speaker. Um, today we have uh, the pleasure of having Dr. Julia Krim, who is a full professor of radiology, currently working at the University of Missouri, where she serves as the chief of the MSK section. She did her residency and fellowship at UCLA. Dr. Krim serves as a reviewer for many radiology and orthopedic journals, and among her many accomplishments in her career, she was recently awarded the designation of top reviewer for AJR in 2020. She serves on many local and national committees, has directed a number of educational courses, and is a prolific writer with numerous articles in high-impact radiology and orthopedic peer-reviewed journals. As an example, before we started, we were just reviewing one of her wonderful uh, papers about temporal evolution of rotator cuff repairs after arthroscopy in AJR. Um, and if you all haven't seen that video or that uh, article yet, strongly would encourage you to take a look. Um, Dr. Krim has also written uh, books, book chapters, and is frequently invited to serve as a visiting professor. Uh, she's a regular speaker at societal conferences and having been in the audience a few times, I can say we're in for a treat today. Thank you for taking the time to speak, and I will now turn it over to you, Dr. Krim. Did that work? That worked. All set. Wonderful. Um, I would like to thank Adam for inviting me to join this very distinguished roster of uh, speakers, which he's put together, and a wonderful idea for a pandemic. And hopefully I'll get to see people in person, which as we all know, is definitely um, something that we <laughs> prefer. Um, so I was thrilled when he called me this spring and invited me to speak on any topic of my choosing. It's like, wow, what an invitation. And I chose to spoke, uh, speak about scoliosis. You might say, why scoliosis is a topic? Well, many people don't find it all that interesting, let's be honest. But in your practice as an MSK radiologist or a general radiologist, you will see a lot of it. And anything you see a lot of, you want to understand. Understanding scoliosis makes it more interesting. It's also associated with many different diseases and we'll review some gamuts useful for board review because I thought we might have residents preparing for the boards here. But even if you're past the boards, it's still useful to have those gamuts as things that you can uh, leaf through in your mind. And different types of scoliosis are distinctly on um, imaging. So when you understand scoliosis, it really helps you diagnose disease. And you can contribute to patient care by noticing things that orthopedic surgeon may not notice. They're often focused just on the measurements. You're thinking about the whole film and you'll come up with uh, additional findings that they will be grateful that you have done. So first, what is scoliosis? You have to meet two criteria to diagnose scoliosis. One is a lateral curvature of the spine that measures 10 degrees or more. The other is both the superior and the inferior portions are curved to form an arc, because otherwise it's just a tilt of the spine. And sometimes I have residents when the, the patient is inclining over to one side on a lumbar spine, wanting to say there's a scoliosis. And I have to say, no, we don't know that's a scoliosis until we can see both ends of the curve. And although the definition is based on the coronal plane deformity, the sagittal plane deformity is also very important. So why does scoliosis matter? As we look at this portable chest radiograph on a young infant, we can see that he has a very severe thoracic dextroscoliosis and his lung volumes are very poor and he's got deformity of his thoracic cage. So this is the first thing that can be a big problem is respiratory compromise. Usually you have to have a curve of 80 degrees or more before that is achieved. 
Also, patients with neuromuscular scoliosis may have a spinal imbalance, and they're not able to sit in a wheelchair. And that's very significant for them, because if they can't sit in a wheelchair, they're bedridden, and there goes their quality of life. Pain is also a feature most commonly with degenerative scoliosis or with an idiopathic scoliosis that has developed secondary degeneration. And then finally, a patient who's unhappy about the deformity and wants to look like everybody else. The standard terms that we use in scoliosis, the end vertebra is the vertebra at each end of the curve. The apical vertebra is a vertebra that shows the greatest displacement from midline. The dextroscoliosis means the apex is to the right, and levoscoliosis means apex to the left. We measure scoliosis using a standard technique. It's not the only technique that's been developed, but it's really the one that superseded others, and that is the method of Cobb, where we measure the angle between the end vertebrae using the superior end plate at the top of the curve and the inferior end plate at the bottom of the curve. So then the question becomes, how do you recognize the end vertebra? Sometimes it's not that obvious. Well, you want to find the vertebra that has the greatest deviation from the horizontal. And if you're not sure, you can compare it to the adjacent end point. So if I didn't use this level that I've chosen, I went up one level, I would not have as big a curve. The deviation from the horizontal is less. So clearly the yellow dotted line is not the correct level. The white solid line is. You can also look to the vertebra where the spinous process returns to being centered on the vertebral body when the, there is a rotary component. So all idiopathic scoliosis and many cases of other types of scoliosis have rotation as part of the deformity. So if you look at the end vertebra, you can see that the spinous process is centered right there on the vertebral body. But as we move up to the apical vertebra, the spinous process becomes progressively more over to the side uh, because of the rotation, which will be greatest at the apex of the scoliotic curve. So if you look at your spinous process, that will give you a secondary useful method of confirming that you have the correct end vertebra chosen. When you report the case, you should state which levels were measured and you should compare to priors, usually a recent prior and a remote prior, reporting the change over time. That brings us to the question of how accurate are we? What's our inner observer variability? And only a couple of people here will recognize this little device here, a goniometer. Uh, inner observer variability has been reported to be anywhere between two and seven degrees, but most of that's old data from the days when we took a hard copy film, we marked it with a big thick crayon, then we went at uh, 90 degrees relative to that angle so that we could get this geometrically equivalent angle and measure that with our little goniometer. And there were multiple areas where error could creep in using that method. And of course, we don't do that any longer. Uh, one recent report using PACS said that there's five degrees of variability. In my practice group, I find there's an average of about two degrees of difference or up to two degrees. It's amazing to me how often they're right on using the standard PACS tools I haven't gotten around to writing a paper on that because let's face it, it would be a fairly tedious paper statistically to write. Um, when comparing films over time, I always redo the original measurements just to make sure that I'm being as accurate as possible. And I will say by my measurement in 2016, the scoliosis was such and such, um, just so that we have the most accurate we possibly can. Sometimes you find that unfortunately you can't see the end type. So here's a patient who has a degenerative scoliosis, and where exactly is the end plate of L1, which is going to be the top of our curve? And if the patient has osteoporosis or there's a kyphotic component, it really can be difficult to see. So in those cases, the pedicles make a very good surrogate to the end plate because they are always parallel to the end plate unless there's a spinal segmentation anomaly. So what you do is you draw a line parallel to the uh, top of the pedicles here. And then for the inferior end plate, we can see the end plate quite well, so we can use that as our mark. And this will be reproducible and accurate. Coronal balance is critically important in evaluation of scoliosis. The spine should be right exactly straight in the coronal plane. C7 should be centered on S1, and you draw a plumb line which is what builders use. We put a weight and draw a line down, it goes straight down, no deviation. 
And from the middle of C7, you should go right down to the middle of S1. Scoliosis, on the other hand, is not just a curvature, but it's often an unbalanced curvature. And this uh, illustration is from a very nice review article in AGR in 2010, when it shows the degree of unbalance or imbalance of the coronal plane. So we've drawn a line down from C7, we've drawn a line up from S1, and the distance X is the distance between those lines, and that's the degree of imbalance. If C7 is to the left, as it is here, we call it negative coronal imbalance. If C7 is to the right, we call it positive coronal imbalance. And how do you remember that? Well, I'm left-handed. So I know there's a prejudice towards people being right-handed and right is right. So it's positive to be right-handed. It's positive to have your scoliosis go to the right and negative if you go to the left, um, if that helps you remember. In general, I don't rely on mnemonics, especially after 30 years, because I need a mnemonic to keep track of my mnemonics, but I like stupid tricks. And that's an example of one of my stupid tricks. I'll give you another one in a minute. Your report should always include this measurement. It should be standard in your report. We want to think not only about sagittal, a coronal plane balance, but also about sagittal plane balance. Normally, again, C7 is centered on S1. In this case, on the posterior superior uh, cortex of S1. But it's more complex than in the coronal plane because instead of being straight down, we have a balance of two opposing curves. Normally, the thoracic kyphosis is less than 40 degrees from P3 to P12, and lumbar lordosis is between 25 and 40 degrees from L1 to L5. So here's the corresponding guy. Oops, here's our idiopathic scoliosis uh, for comparison. And you can see we've lost the normal thoracic kyphosis, and we've lost the normal uh, lordosis. And um, we can also see that rotary component with the ribs coming out. Um, and as we measure, uh, the scoliotic sagittal plane balance, we can often see that the balance is lost or reversed. So we measure it similar to the way we do for the coronal balance, uh, a diagram from that same article, drawing a plumb line from the center of C7 down and measuring the distance from this line to the posterior superior margin of S1. And that's our distance X. And if it's less than four centimeters, we consider that normal. Anterior displacement of C7 is positive sagittal imbalance. That's easy to remember because you can imagine the head's in a hurry to get someplace and the uh, sacrum's still back there. So you're positive, you're leaning forward um, and negative if you're leaning back. The next concept is structural versus flexible scoliosis. This is important in preoperative planning because a surgeon wants to know how much can you correct the curve. And to a large extent, that's dependent on how much of that curve is flexible. So there's several different ways that you can evaluate. The classic is what I've shown here, where the patient bend, stands upright and bends to the right and bends to the left. So here's our thoracic dextroscoliosis. And when the patient bends to the right, there's improvement, and you'll report the measurement for both of those. There's still a fairly significant scoliosis. Uh, uh, other methods that have been advocated as equivalent or just comparing a supine film to an upright film, or placing traction on the head to see if you can pull that spine straight. The portion of the curve which doesn't correct is considered structural. Vertebral body rotation is also important in scoliosis. So you see it's a 3D deformity here, isn't it? It's not just a coronal problem. Uh, it's present in all cases of idiopathic scoliosis. And it's variably present in other causes. It's usually present in degenerative, for instance. And it creates that rib hump. And that's often the finding that makes people recognize scoliosis out in the community. They look at the child and see that hump. It's difficult to measure how much uh, rotation there is on the radiographs, but you can measure it quite easily on 3D CT. So here's a 3D CT looking down the barrel of the scoliosis. And you can measure the angle between the end and apical vertebrae and report that. That brings us to the question of how much do we want to use advanced imaging and scoliosis? Radiographs are still the mainstay, but look at this child who has a syndromic scoliosis and look at the radiographs. And it's just kind of desperate. How are you going to describe everything that's going on here? And the 3D is really very helpful. 
And today we can use that 3D CT to build a 3D model if the surgeon wants us to do that. So as we look at this case, we can see uh, the scoliosis, we can see the kyphosis, we can see the rotation. And those I tend to put fairly qualitatively into my report. Um, and this we would uh, uh, call a gibbous deformity, uh, almost like what we see in tuberculosis of the spine. It's such a hairpin turn of the spine in that location. We use MR to look for tethered cord, carry one malformation, or syrinx in a curve that's a typical primary. So pasting films is something that can get to be a bit of an issue as well. So here's a film that's been pasted together on packs. Uh, in order to cover that whole thoracic and lumbar spine, generally takes two to three images. So in the past, we'd have these special long cassettes that we ran with the processor, and we'd combine two or three exposures to make that long cassette, showing as if it was a continuous spine. Today, what we do is there's a computer algorithm that takes different images, matches them, and pastes them. Bad pasting may mimic an abnormality, and I do amuse myself every now and then by showing this film to my residents and saying, what's the matter here? And they say, oh my golly gee willikers, this patient's had a horrible injury. Um, but one thing you also notice the size is slightly different. We really did a bad job here. This is not a dislocation. This is a patient who walked into clinic, but fortunately you can override that computer piece manually. You go and find the tech and the tech goes back and repastes it. And we can see this patient does not have a normal spine. This patient does not have any subluxation. Sometimes I see it be a parent pneumothoraces too, or a pneumoparent pneum, and that uh, is a cause for alarm. And you just go find your tech and you do it. Or you look at the source images, which won't have a heart effect. EOS is a fairly new technique that's become very fashionable among orthopedic surgeons. It's a low dose system and does continuous linear scanning from superior to inferior. So you don't have any issues with the pasting, but it can be affected by respiratory motion. Here's a typical image that we obtain on a nice slender patient in our system. And we can see that we don't quite have the fine bony detail that we get with DR, but it's certainly adequate for following the scoliosis over time. And I always ask our surgeons to get regular radiographs first and then we'll follow it with EOS, just so that we don't miss subtle bony abnormalities that we might miss on the EOS system. It does allow 3D reformatting. Unfortunately, in order to obtain this, you have to send it to the vendor and pay for paste. So here's one where EOS has kindly marked the end vertebrae and the apical vertebrae, but hopefully we don't need them to get that correct. So we can divide causes of scoliosis into uncommon and common uh, causes. So common by far the most will be idiopathic. Then we have degenerative, neuromuscular, traumatic, and Schroederman kyphosis, which is one people forget is a cause of scoliosis. Uncommon gets to be fairly long, doesn't it? Infection, tumor, associated with syndromes, congenital, post-surgical, chest wall abnormality, or even neuropathic arthropathy. So how can we tell the, all those many types of scoliosis apart? where we want to look at the curve morphology and the presence or absence of pain. So what are our key morphologic features? They are, is it a short curve or a long curve? And if it's short, does it look angular? Is it a single curve, which we call a C curve, a double curve, which we call an S curve, or triple, which doesn't get an fancy name? Then we look at the direction of the curve, which surprisingly is important. Then we look for segmentation anomaly. Then we look at the sagittal plane deformity, which is key to telling different types apart. So let's start with the short curve scoliosis. What causes a short curve scoliosis, meaning two to five vertebrae? Uh, most commonly, it will be either degenerative or traumatic. Less commonly, it will be infection, tumor, post-surgical, congenital, neuropathic arthropathy, or a chest wall abnormality. And this being academics, of course, the picture that I've chosen to illustrate for you is one of the least common of all of these. It's the bottom of my list because these are in descending order. Um, and we see this funny little strut here that is separating these ribs on the right and causing a little short curve scoliosis. And this patient had a chest CT done for a different reason. So I was able to show that this is a little rib anomaly 
that is holding those two ribs apart and creating scoliosis. So this is the only one I've seen in 30 years. So it's something to have at the back of your eye. Maybe it's the chest wall, but it's definitely not a common finding. Whenever you have a short rib scoliosis, you really want to look at it very carefully. So this is a middle-aged man without underlying problems, except for diabetes. Uh, that's sort of normal these days, isn't it? Um, and he comes in and he's been having back pain that's been getting worse over a number of months. Uh, doesn't have any systemic signs. Um, but whenever you see that short curve scoliosis, you know there's going to be a high likelihood of bone abnormality. So looking at this, you say, is this old trauma that's developed a generation and he's hurting because it's degenerated? Could it be due to infection? Could it be due to neoplasm? So one important clue that we can see just on this clean film is that the end plates are indistinct. You actually couldn't see it well on the lateral because it's really indistinct only on one side. So that's a little bit of an unusual finding, but it's definitely a concerning finding. So we ordered a CT on this patient and the CT makes it a no brainer because we can see we have large end plate erosions. Uh, we can see that we have uh, sclerosis centered on those erosions. And we can see that we have this large paraspinous abscess. Now, I can imagine that one of the attendings in the audience is saying, well, we do see erosions with degenerative disease. And we know that we do. But these uh, erosions are larger, more ill-defined. And then fortunately, the soft tissue really makes the diagnosis worse. Sometimes it can be hard to tell the degenerative from the very early infections. But that's a topic for a different lecture. So we made a diagnosis here unequivocally of discitis Oscar myelitis, and this turned out to be staph aureus. And one of the things that can be difficult in discitis Oscar myelitis is that symptoms are vague. They often don't have fevers. Uh, there's a long delay in diagnosis because of the vagueness. And you're going to say to me, well, why is it asymmetric? Why isn't it involving the whole disc? And probably it's because it originated in the psoas there and then moved into the disc space and into the vertical bodies. But this is a variant that you'll see with that. This one is far more than one case, unlike the other one. Long curve scoliosis has a fairly short list. Idiopathic, syndromic, neuromuscular will be the absolute longest. This is a classic neuromuscular scoliosis with this very long C-shaped curve. And you also have other important clues. And then you see that the patient uh, has uh, hip abnormalities that are characteristic of a cerebral palsy. And occasionally degenerative will give you a long curve scoliosis, much more common to have a short curve. Then painful scoliosis. Most scoliosis is not painful. So if you have a painful scoliosis, you wanna think hard about it. Is it degenerative? Is it trauma? Is it infection? Or is it tumor? Um, when I first got to the University of Utah, one of my very first cases that came across at the end of the day, when I sent the resident home, was a scoliosis centered at C7 that just looked a little funny. And I said, we have to investigate this further. And if you make a good call in your first month at a new place, you're in like Flint. If you make a bad call in your first month, it's all over. So watch out for that first call. And always have this in the back of your mind, certainly uncommon, but something you want to think about. I didn't know it was painful, but it turned out that it was. So now let's turn from that general approach that we've developed to looking at specific types of scoliosis and the distinctive features that allow the diagnosis. So starting with idiopathic scoliosis, which is by far the most common, about two thirds of all cases of scoliosis are idiopathic. It's more common in girls. It can present at any time from infancy to adolescence. The earlier the presentation, usually the more rapidly progressive the curve will be. Generally, it will not progress after skeletal maturity unless the curve is more than 50 degrees. So what's the morphology of the idiopathic scoliosis? It's usually an S-shaped curve, sometimes a triple, sometimes single thoracic. And the most severe of these curves is considered the primary curve. The curve is smooth. There is no angular deformity. And the thoracic curve is very strongly convex right. It's convex left, you're going to worry about it. We'll discuss that in a moment. So here we get to another of my stupid tricks that I live by. Why is it characteristic that that curve be to the right? And I always say to myself, well, the beating heart pushes it over that way, which is probably completely false. But it's still true that whatever the reason is, 
that iliopathic scoliosis will have a thoracic curve convex to the right. And it always will have a rotational component. This is a different patient than the one I showed before. And you can see how pronounced the, the rib hump is on this side. Uh, and you can see um, the marked deviation of the uh, spinous process due to that rotational component. You can also see that we have straightening of the thoracic and straightening of the lumbar ergodosis. We do not have any significant hypotic deformity, unlike other types that we will see in a moment. The measurements in idiopathic scoliosis are the guide to treatment. So if the curve is less than 20 degrees, they'll generally observe it. If there's 20 to 40 degrees, they will apply your brace. Now, I don't know if you all have seen these braces. They're pretty darn impressive and uncomfortable. We're asking a teenage girl to wear this big, long brace. So if she will be compliant, there's 75% successful in preventing progression. The problem is they're supposed to wear it like 20 to 22 hours a day. It's not minor. And they will consider surgery if there's a progressive curve and the patient is skeletally immature. If the curve is more than 40 degrees, because these patients have an increased risk of chronic back pain, or if there's respiratory compromise. But as we've seen, respiratory compromise requires a pretty high level of scoliosis. There are a number of long-term studies that show good outcomes of non-surgical management. Be aware, as you're looking at these films, that if the thoracic curve is convex to the left, you have a high incidence of underlying abnormality. So we look at this patient and we see this thoracic curve is to the left. We're going to be concerned about this. They may have a syrinx, they may have a PRI1, they may have a congenital vertebral anomaly, they may have a tethered cord, they may have some complex congenital syndrome. Uh, they may also have a tumor that's causing it or neuromuscular disease. But if the list gets long, as soon as our curve is going in the wrong direction. Um, this one, we knew had a syndrome, and most of this is fortunately today based on molecular diagnosis, not based on radiographs anymore. And they finally came up with maybe this was Gubowitz syndrome. Uh, it's not something, fortunately, that we are at the front lines of diagnosing anymore. So this is a young eight-year-old boy who is asymptomatic, but his mother noticed that he had a curvature. So she took him to the primary care. We took him to an orthopedic surgeon who noticed that that curve was atypical. It's a very slight curve, isn't it? You're impressed that the mom even noticed that. But because the curve was atypical, the spine surgeon ordered an MRI. And here's the MRI in that same boy. And you can see he's got really a pretty large thoracic syrinx. And of course, we gave contrast. It's the first presentation of any syrinx, the standard. And there was no evidence of any neoplasm. And they recommended that the patient have surgery. The patient did not undergo surgery. And um, I found out about how he's doing now as I was looking back at patients for this talk. And I discovered that now on physical exam by an orthopedic surgeon, he has no neurologic issues, totally normal strength and gait and balance. But he did dislocate his shoulder when he was playing football. So I think he's doing pretty well in spite of his sense. Also be aware as you're looking at these of abnormalities above or below the curve. So it's actually very common to have spondylolysis at L4, L5 in these patients who have idiopathic scoliosis, probably because of the increased asymmetric stress. So if you fuse this patient, you're going to stress this region further and destabilize it. So always make sure you check it on the scoliosis films. And then, of course, everybody's looking back at their source images, right, to look for specific spine abnormalities after they do their measurements on the pasted image. Neuromuscular scoliosis is the next most common. It can be caused by neurologic diseases, such as cerebral palsy. It can be caused by muscular dystrophies. And it's in either case, an imbalance in the musculature causes a scoliosis. It's often rapidly progressive, especially if the onset is younger than age six, and it's usually rigid. You'd expect it to be flexible because it's a muscle problem, but it's not. And it's very hard to treat and to correct. So here's a young child who clearly has cerebral palsy. Again, you look at the hips and you look at the pump, um, and you can see the severity of this single long C-shaped curve, nicely shown here on the 3D CT. It can also be a double curve in some cases, but that's what's common. The direction, unlike idiopathic scoliosis, the direction is quite variable. And that infantile kyphosis that we're all born with 
often useless because the patient doesn't have normal weight-bearing stress in order to induce the appropriate adult double curve in the sagittal plane. And often you'll see a pretty severe growth disturbance. Look at this vertical body and how wedged it is. That's not a segmentation anomaly. That's just a growth disturbance because of this early onset of severe scoliosis. You'll see a little bit of wedging in idiopathic scoliosis, but not to this degree. And this is probably one of the reasons why this is difficult to treat. Degenerative scoliosis is next. So when I was a resident, uh, they told me that there was no such thing as degenerative scoliosis, that it was patient scoliosis is then degenerated. And of course, over the course of my career, I've seen this happen many times, and it's been a recent focus of discussion in the orthopedic literature, the development of uh, degenerative scoliosis. Almost always will be in the lumbar spine, much more common to see a short curve than a long curve. And the patient develops degeneration first. Here we can see this, this degeneration at L2-3, and then we can see the scoliosis is developed three years later at that same level. It's probably due to muscle imbalance and people have tried to prevent this progressing with physical therapy. Uh, it doesn't really work. It does have a rotational component, as we can see here, almost always. The lordosis tends to be decreased. It's often quite painful, either because of the bony problems or the resultant neurologic problems, and it does progress in action. So pain and degenerative scoliosis correlates to the more severe curvature. This one's got a pretty severe unbalanced curvature with a positive coronal plane imbalance. Facet osteophytis, which is almost always at the concave aspect. Lysthesis, and have got a lateral lysthesis at two levels here, up here, as well as down here, and abnormal sagittal plane alignment. So look at this sagittal plane alignment, and we've really reversed our normal uh, lumbar lordosis. And then in, in compensation, the patient has straightened their thoracic kyphosis to try to achieve an overall better balance you can see this will still be more than four centimeters of positive sagittal plane imbalance. Sometimes we'll see degenerative scoliosis after fusion. So this patient came in in 2009 and had two levels of disc degeneration and was treated appropriately with a, a two level of fusion here. And you can see that immediately after the fusion, uh, the, uh, um, the intervertebral space looks normal. Then we start to develop asymmetric narrowing and by two years following the fusion, we have a pretty significant scoliosis. And then what do you do? Do we continue fusing the spine up? And many surgeons will do that. So I've had the good fortune to work with two phenomenal spine surgeons, Dr. Daryl Brodke at the University of Utah and Dr. Ted Choma here at the University of Missouri. And they are very similar in their practices, but they differ on this. Dr. Brodke used to fuse much higher up to T10 Dr. Choma tends to be more minimalist. And I'd love to do an inter, um, an inter uh, institution study one day because I think their patients do equally well. I don't think that fusing up to T10 is really going to make things better for this patient in the long run. So I've come around to Dr. Choma's idea is we do the least we have to do in order to make this patient better. And we let tomorrow worry about tomorrow. Traumatic scoliosis uh, is another one that we want to consider. Here's a nice one where we can see it developing. Uh, so there's an asymmetric burst fracture of C3, which is a short curve, creating a short burst scoliosis one month later. If you just saw this film, you might not be sure exactly why we have the short curve scoliosis, but uh, given the uh, change over time, we can do it. It's also an angular curve, just like the one we saw that was due to an infection. This is a much more common uh, traumatic scoliosis. This is an elderly woman, and you can see that she has multiple compression fractures. And this one just happened to be asymmetric and created this little focal scoliosis. There. Can a surgeon make that better? That's really difficult, isn't it? Because uh, no hardware is going to hold well in this patient. Congenital scoliosis is next, and this has a very specific meaning. It means failure of segmentation or formation of vertebra. We call it fusion, but it really isn't fusion. It's a problem with the segmentation. It's often very complex and multi-novel. Here we see a dextrous scoliosis, that's short curve in the cervical spine. And then another scoliosis is now convex to the left, 
at this uh, cervical thoracic junction, and they kind of balance each other out. Each affected region has a short curve, and those multiple curves may balance each other. And the progression of the curve will be variable, and it depends on exactly what kind of segmentation and abnormality you have. So we use specific terminology to describe these uh, congenital deformities. A block vertebra is two more or more levels. You see here three vertebra forming a block. And we can see they're almost floating relative to the vertebra next to them. And there's another block up here in the thoracic spine. We call it a heavy vertebra when only one side of the vertebra is present, as we see in this case. And we call it a butterfly vertebra when both sides are present, but divided by a cleft. We call it a vertebral bar when there's a focal bony connection between two vertebrae. Then the question becomes, is it balanced or is unbalanced? Are the abnormalities matched on both sides? Um, so the morphology of congenital scoliosis does get to be difficult to describe. We do our best, and when the 3D CT helps, it's easier than the MR in this case, because we can see in the MR that we've got quite a bit of rotation, um, and that makes it difficult to get uh, the vertebra in plane. We can do that on our 3D CT and see the rotation, the sagittal plane, and the coronal plane. But we see that it's actually a short curve for the scoliosis itself, um, and it has a sharp angulation and often has a kyphosis as well. In this case, there's an unbalanced segmentation anomaly, which we see right here, this little nubbin of a vertebra, that's all that formed in that vertebra, and it fused the vertebra below. But that can continue to grow and cause the scoliosis to worsen as the child grows. So that unbalanced vertebra is important, and we always want to make sure we describe it adequately in your report, because it will lead to progressive curvature as the child grows. So this a hemi vertebra on the right, which you see on radiographs and MR, is fused to the vertebra above, but down below it has a disc. So it's actually fairly free to grow here, but there's nothing to grow on this side. And we're going to express this curve uh, to uh, progress. So this is a gamut that gets us out of scoliosis, but gets us into thinking about boards and about life, which is just the boards we ducks. Um, so uh, fused vertebral bodies can be congenital. That's really failure of segmentation. Can follow infection. It can be degenerative, autofusion. It can be surgical. It can be due to dish, or it can be due to seronegative spondyloarthropathy. So you always want to have that list in your mind when you see vertebral bodies that have been fused. So then let's look at them side by side. Is that vertebral body quote fusion congenital or acquired? So we have congenital on the left and acquired in adulthood on the right. This is a patient with autofusion due to a severe disc degeneration. But if the uh, vertebrae are fused at, or not segmented, sorry, um, at birth, there won't be normal stress uh, by the skeleton and the muscles on that level. And so it doesn't grow correctly. If the, the affected vertebra will have a narrower AP dimension than the vertebra above and below. And then they tend to have a wasp waist deformity right here in the middle. Whereas if it's acquired in adulthood, you will see a normal AP dimension of the vertebral bodies. And one little caveat, if the fusion occurs in early childhood, it will have the same appearance as congenital. So juvenile idiopathic arthritis will look very much like a congenital fusion when it causes fusion. So then we get to another gamut. What are associations with a congenital scoliosis? We all know vactoral, you know, clipal file syndrome, sprangle deformity, diastomatomyelia. Diasta I can usually say that, but it's still early in the morning. Syrinx or telecord. So here's a rather vintage example of an MR where you can see this huge block vertebra and fusions uh, at multiple levels. And then you know, there's a bony septum in the middle and they divided the cord into two hemichords. This fortunately is pretty darn common. So we've learned a lot about scoliosis. Let's learn that we take what we've learned and apply it to this case. What kind of scoliosis do we have here? Well, first we look carefully and there are no segmentation anomalies. There are long curves. There's sort of an S. There's an upper thoracic dextrous scoliosis and a thoracolumbar levis scoliosis. It's centered higher than usual for idiopathic. So it gives you a uh, pause for just a moment. But the real clue 
that lets you know that we're dealing with something very different from idiopathy is the lateral radiograph. There's a severe kyphosis right here at the third columnar junction, and there's also scalloping of the posterior vertebral body. And we simply won't see either of those findings with idiopathic scoliosis. So our mind is immediately going to jump to something like Ehlers-Danlos or Marfan syndrome. So let's take that gamut for posterior vertebral body scalloping. There are two major causes. One is an intraspinal neoplasm or cysts, and another is duralectasia, uh, either due to connective tissue disorder, neurofibromatosis type 1, achondroplasia, or mucopolysaccharidosis. So in this case, the diagnosis was Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and this patient also had a CP and MR, which make the findings very obvious. Notice how the uh, discs are often quite abnormal in Ehlers-Danlos as part of this generalized abnormality of connective tissue. So that is our segue into syndromic scoliosis. Syndromic scoliosis is not congenital scoliosis. Congenital scoliosis is segmentation abnormalities. So even though the syndrome is congenital, we do not call it congenital scoliosis. And there are a variety of syndromes associated with scoliosis, neurofibromatosis, connective tissue diseases, osteogenesis imperfecta, and osteoporosis. Let's we'll just look at a couple of these. And the morphology of the curves is highly variable. So here's an uh, unfortunate patient with really severe osteogenesis imperfecta. And the multiple fractures have caused this very complex scoliosis, which takes a hairpin curve there in the lower thoracic spine. And there are multiple vertebra plana, which is another clue that we have osteogenesis imperfecta. Another nice gamut, of course, is multiple vertebra plana. And this is going to be very difficult to treat. How are you going to fix this? The osteoporosis will tend to make any fixation fail. But this is also osteogenesis imperfecta, a much less severe case. Uh, we can see that this patient has a mild scoliosis with a thoracic right curve. But we also see another finding on this film in response to the whole film. We look at these sclerotic bands in the metathesis, and those are going to be stigmata of quarterly bisphosphonate treatment in childhood for the osteogenesis imperfecta and leads us towards the right diagnosis. Neurofibromatosis type 1 is another important cause of scoliosis. And remember that this is not just about neurofibromas. It's a multi-system genetic disorder. And the skeletal dysplasia it causes scoliosis, thin grass cell bones, congenital pseudothesis, the tibia, and ribbed and ribs. In this case, we can see masses on either side of the spine. So we're pretty darn sure this patient has uh, neurofibromas. But the scoliosis is not due to neoplasm. The scoliosis is due to the mesenchymal disorder. Also, I have bluish nodules. I unfortunately don't have to worry about those and optic nerve problems. So then here is a different case from the one I mentioned before of scoliosis due to osteoidosteoma. So this is clearly a young patient, and he's got this funny little lower lumbar scoliosis. And as soon as you see that, you see that's a pretty short curve scoliosis. And there's no vertebral anomalies. Our end plates are well defined, unlike that case of infection. What gives here? So, anytime you're looking at the vertebrae, you're going to look at the vertebral body, you can look at the pedicles, you can look at the transverse processes, spinous process, lamina, pars articularis, and you're going to look up and down and side to side. And you'll see, if you look carefully, that one of these is different from the other. So, yes, we did call this on the pancreas. Um, it's a short curve. Scoliosis is usually mild. It is a painful scoliosis. So in our short list of painful scoliosis, although we may not know that, we know that the histories we get are often made are quite a bit to the side. The tumor will always be on the concave side. So we do an MR to confirm the diagnosis we've already made on radiographs. Uh, sorry, CT we did in this case. And you can see this small lesion that's got little stipples within it that reflect osteoblastoma. And I know I shouldn't say this because it's always supposed to be distinctive, the type of matrix that you have. But sometimes osteoblastoma and chondroblastoma look very similar. But fortunately, we don't really see chondroblastomas here. And we do see osteoblastomas. So we said this was most consistent with osteoblastoma, which is what it turned out to be. You can also have spurious scoliosis. 
So you look at this and you kind of like to make a scoliosis, right? It's more than 10 degrees. It curves both at the top and the bottom. Then you look at the iliac crest and you say, wait a minute, something else is going on here. So this can be due to a limb length inequality and scoliosis films must always be obtained with equal limb length. So if there's a short leg, you put a block under that short leg, that's the correct height. And if it's a supine radiograph, a poorly positioned radiograph can mimic scoliosis. Now we get to move on to kyphosis. I think my time is just about exactly right. So normal thoracic kyphosis, less than 40 degrees, measured from T3 to T12. Then there's a transition to a lumbar lordosis at the thoracolumbar junction, and a transition to the cervical lordosis at the cervical thoracic junction. The normal lordosis is 25 to 40 degrees, so if you have a neutral alignment of your lumbar lordosis, that is a kyphotic deformity. I don't usually call it that in my report because it gets people confused, but I'll say there's complete loss of the lumbar lordosis. Kyphosis does change with age. So infants have a single long curve kyphosis, and as they start to sit and walk, they develop the lumbar lordosis. Thoracic kyphosis increases from adulthood to adolescence, from childhood to adolescence and adulthood, and often throughout adulthood. So let's think about causes of, uh, of kyphosis. I put an uncommon cause over here, because of course uh, this is academics and you can see this patient comes in, she had Crohn's disease and she has a pretty significant kyphosis in 2015. In 2020, it's increased and you can just very faintly see those thin synarthrosis, syndesmophytes, there we go. Um, along those vertebral bodies that are gradually causing this kyphosis. So the common causes will be idiopathic, postural, degenerative, trauma, Scheuermann's, or insufficiency factors. Uncommon will have a pretty long list, and these you can always look up. Idiopathic kyphosis is unfortunately quite common. It starts because of poor posture. Initially, it's flexible, but over time, it becomes rigid, and it tends to be associated with premature disc degeneration as it becomes structural. In older patients, you'll have mild vertebral wedging that's related to the kyphosis, rather, and it's a result rather than the cause of the formula. So this was not actually a concussion fracture. It's treated with bracing, compliance is poor, and results are poor. Schwerman's kyphosis is next. And we can see here that we have multiple wedged vertebral bodies. And when you see this, you even if the patient comes in as a trauma level one, you're not gonna think about trauma because that would be extremely unusual. We have multiple schmarl zones. And schmarl zones and invagination of disc material through the vertebral body end plate. And the kyphosis happens because there are multiple schmarl nodes at three or more contiguous level and at least five degrees of wedging at each level. And you'll notice that this patient also has a little bit of a scoliosis. And about 15% of patients will have that scoliosis. They may be asymptomatic, they may have back pain. And when you do MRs on these, you almost always see premature disc degeneration. So people have said in the past that it's a problem with the end plate. I think it's just as much a problem with the disc. Most common in the thoracic spine, it can be centered at the thoracolumbar junction, and it rarely can involve just the lumbar spine. Too. So don't rule out the diagnosis if you just see these typical findings in the lumbar spine. Neuromuscular kyphosis is next. So this present uh, persistence of the infantile curve with a long thoracolumbar curve due to absence of normal weight bearing and muscle weakness. So here's a congenital kyphosis for comparison. So different from what we saw with that neuromuscular. There's a segmentation anomaly that's often left on the anteriorly. Again, we have that lost base configuration, may or may not have scoliosis associated with the congenital kyphosis. And often, as in this case, we have pretty severe adjacent segment degeneration because of increased stress at these levels. So here's the frontal view on that same patient. You can see in this case, we have both congenital kyphosis and congenital scoliosis. Let's move on to scoliosis surgery. And what's the radiologist's role in that? And we do have an important role, both pre-op and post-op. So on that pre-op CT, you want to check the pedicle spot. Sometimes the pedicles are really diminutive, too small for screws. And if the pedicle looks small, you want to report the transverse size of that pedicle. You want to use the CT to check for subtle congenital abnormality that might not have been evident on the radiographs. You want to look for fractures and you want to look for spondylolysis. 
And you want to look at generally for the unexpected. So here's a CT myelogram on a patient who had achondroplasia and had a pretty severe kyphoscoliosis, and they were planning to do surgery. So they did a CT myelogram preoperatively. Look at those abnormal, markedly wedged vertebral bodies and that severe kyphotic deformity. And patients like this will often get stress fractures in unusual locations. So we see the superior to the facet has a stress fracture. And then we also see there's a laminar stress fracture. If you don't think about all these things and look for them, you say, oh, it's just an achondroplast, you will miss them. Pre-op MR is done for atypical curves, looking for congenital abnormalities and neurologic abnormalities. This is a patient who has a tethered cord associated with her symptoms. Surgical treatment for scoliosis has evolved considerably over the decades that I've been practicing. Currently, the standard treatment is to put pedicle screws at most, if not all of the levels, and then use interlocking rods. So here's our immediate post-op film, and you want to see not only are our screws looking like in the wrong place, but you do want to notice that this patient has an absolutely enormous pneumothorax. Vertical body tethering is a relatively new method, which is nice because it allows for complete growth in the immature skeleton. So the concept is to limit growth on the convex side, but not on the concave side. So these screws have been placed in the vertical bodies, and they're joined by a radiolucent cord between them, tethering that side of the vertical body. You can also use expandable rods. So this is an unfortunate patient with cerebral palsy. Again, you can see here what a severe curvature she has, greater than 90 degrees. How are we going to correct this and enable this patient to have some quality of life? So what they do for her, or did for her, is to put in magnetically controlled rods so that these could expand as the child grew. And you can see this is not a bad surgeon who placed those hooks in the wrong location. They did that in order to get purchase on the scoliosis and you can see as this child has grown over a number of years, that scoliotic curvature is much less severe than it was earlier. But when this patient uh, reached the teenage years, they went ahead and transferred this uh, at the age of 13 to the conventional uh, treatment. But I think it would have been very hard to get to this place starting there. So post-op, how we're going to evaluate, we'll screen with x-ray, we'll do CT when x-ray doesn't give answer. MR is pretty uncommonly used, but occasionally. And I will follow the same search pattern for what, uh, whatever modality I'm looking at. I'll look at the fuse levels and the hardware. I'll look at the spine above the fusion, I'll look at the spine below the fusion, and I'll look out at the peristyle soft tissues. So there are a number of early post-operative complications that you can see. We see here on the right that this screw has been misplaced with the lateral recess, and there's neural compromise. The patient had tiny particles, and that's part of why this was misplaced, I think. We can see on the CT myelogram that the patient has a significant hematoma. We can see that in this case, that unfortunately there was an intraoperative fracture of the vertebral body. You can also see migration of bone graft, which I've not shown, and dural tear, which can be hard for us to track down and unfortunate infection. Late complications include hardware displacement, loosening, and fracture. Remember that hardware is only a temporary fixation. There, it fails because the bone graft fails to incorporate. There is no man-made construct of any material that will succeed if the bone fails, either in fusion or in fracture fixation. Uh, you can also get adjacent segment degeneration or deformity. So you really have to look carefully at the hardware. This is a patient who had a fusion some time ago, and you can see it was done with a fairly old fashioned way of doing these large fusion masses out to the side. And we knew that she had a fracture of the left rod, but now she comes in with new pain. And this fracture of the right rod was missed on the radiograph, and it was pretty easy to miss. Here on the lateral, we can see the fracture on the left, Fracture on the right, the right as it goes into the screw, very easy to miss, but it was also missed on the CT, and that's really not something you want to do. Here's the easy one on the left, the more difficult one on the right. Um, and here we can see it on the sagittal. On this side, you've got the right, and that's clearly not continuous. And here's the left with the discontinuity. So you have to really take your time looking at these post operative cases. 
Then you want to say, is that fusion successful in general? You would want to be aware of what type and what location of graph material we use. The graphs should always be continuous when you check. You'll see that fusion mass best on CT. Here we can see a pseudoecosis. And if you see a halo, a lucency around the sphere, you know that that's me. So in summary, never assume that scoliosis is idiopathic. That's only about two thirds of the cases. Examine the morphology of the thing and the appearance of each individual vertebrae. Be alert for signs of underlying abnormalities. Examine those post-operative pathways carefully. And finally, when you look at your report, every report of scoliosis should include the levels involved and measurement of the angle, the type of scoliosis, change from prior, including remote prior, sagittal and coronal plane imbalance, and the presence of spinal anomalies, vertebral deformities, spondylolysis, and degenerative findings. Thank you very much for your attention. This is a cat asleep in a Zoom to advise my cat picture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Krim. That was really a great talk. Um, we had a couple questions roll in if you have some time. Sure. Okay, so the first one, and you sort of started um, touching on this with the mention about the transverse measurements of the pedicles. Um, but one of the questions was in general, how do you assess for um, bone stock in general? How do you report for it on the, uh, the pre-op CT? Um, and then I, I guess in addition to the, the transverse diameter of the pedicles, is there anything else about the pedicles that you would mention? Um, I, I mean, sometimes they're really sclerotic. I and mean, that's a present I, I noticed because they've had so much stress on it. There's like no medullary cavity. And the surgeons have dreadful trouble trying to get into those. So I, I can say there's severe cortical thickening with almost complete obliteration of the medullary cavity. And they know what I mean. They know they're going to have trouble with their drill on that pedicle. Um, I went to evaluate osteoporosis on all of these. And we recently gotten a CT bone densitometer. So at our weekly meeting with the spine surgeons, I've been discussing, you know, we should be evaluating for osteoporosis on all of these. Uh, you can do an ad lib osteoporosis measurement without using the phantom, but I really like to do it more accurately uh, with the phantom if at all possible. Got it. Um, a second question, and you also kind of touched on this as well, but uh, does depending on the type of scoliosis or the clinical scenarios, does that sort of triage patients into plain films, MR, and CT, or uh, how does it typically work in your practice? Well, of course, we, we do always start with the plain films, um, and that's good. We get very good quality plain films when you have dedicated text, so that makes a huge difference. Um, CT tends to be our, our usual modality of choice when we're trying to assess a, a difficult curve or uh, do pre-op planning. And MR is reserved, as I said, for the patients who have an atypical curvature um, or neurologic symptoms. Okay. Um, we also got a question. Let's see. Sorry, it's hidden behind here. Um, which parameters uh, for reporting instability in lumbar hyperlordosis uh, do you mention in lateral radiographs? Oh, so instability. Now, instability, of course, is something dynamic. And I'm going to mount a hobby horse for just a second. When you are dictating a report, try not to say something is stable. You can say a pneumonia is stable because that only has one meaning. It means the pneumonia hasn't changed. But if you say a scoliosis is stable, when you mean it hasn't changed, is it actually dynamically stable? Do you know that on a routine film? No. But we do flexion and extension. We do right and left bending. And I will usually say something like no instability is elicited with flexion and extension views. Because the techs, of course, do not push the patient to maximum motion, right? That would be a very bad idea. So often they splint so much that they're just bending at their hips. So no instability was elicited is my phrase to sort of get around that. But the patient achieved limited motion at the levels of concern. Because I don't know that we can always accurately evaluate for that. Certainly if we see a lot of modic changes that might suggest instability, but that's a very, very rough measure as well. And can also just be the degeneration. Got it. Um, the last question um, was some of the less thought about um, uh, scenarios re revolving around these curves. Um, one that I came across um, was, you know, you saw this, this awful looking curve, but the patient was complaining more about uh, impingement on, of the rib cage against the pelvis. And it was, 
you know, yeah. didn't really jump out to me. Um, aside from it, it looked like a significant deformity. Are there other things that we should look um, at that are a little bit outside of, but connected to the spine um, that may be symptomatic in these cases? And that's actually a really important po uh, point. Thank you very much for bringing that up. I'll include it in the next iteration of the lecture because sometimes with the degenerative scoliosis, we do see the rib cage right up against the iliac crest. Um, uh, in terms of other things, we read, certainly the respiratory compromise, um, uh, but uh, sitting, being able to sit in a wheelchair. Can't think of anything else on the top of my head right now. Okay, perfect. Well, I think that was it for questions from today. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk. That was one of the more comprehensive spine talks I've seen in a while. So thank you so much for filling in that gap for everyone. You're very welcome. It's just like, we're, we're gonna to have to do spine. We might as well really leap into it um, and, and make the most of it. And it's become, in my mind, one of the most interesting parts of my practice. Uh, yeah, and of course, building those relationships with the surgeons helps tremendously in that as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you again so much, Dr. Krim and to everyone else, uh, stay safe. And I uh, will upload this video to the channel later yeah, And on. thank you so much for inviting me. It was a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you again. Thanks. Bye. Take care.